Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. I like meeting with some sort of open-heartedness and kindness. It's a rare opportunity to see one of the great collections of armor in America. I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's my everything. Today on Spotlight, the history of armor. Why this exhibit also features Star Wars Stormtroopers and Black Panther. Plus, why MoDOT is partnering with engineers to study earthquakes and evacuation options. And then a New York Times best-selling author talks about her latest detective novel. But first, a U-City High graduate makes it big as a feature animator for Walt Disney. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. I'm Marlon West from Walt Disney Animation Studios. I'm currently a visual effects supervisor, but most of my career has been spent doing special effects animation. I've always wanted to make films since I was like a little kid. And um, I, I got a movie camera for my 12th birthday, Super 8 camera, and tried to make films with my brother Tony and kids in the neighborhood. I always loved the work of Ray Harrahausen, who did all the Sinbad movies and Jason and the Argonauts. And all those are done in stop motion, where you're actually a moving puppet, you know, one frame at a time. So what I started doing was using like the toys I had around the house to do like stop motion films. So as a result, my scale shrunk down, but my production value went up a lot higher because I had all these sweet costumes and vehicles for the G.I. Joe. And so my films got a lot richer looking because you can only get your hands on so much as a 12 year old. I mentioned Ray Harrahausen. His mentor was a guy, Willis O'Brien, and Willis O'Brien did all of the animation of King Kong. So somewhere in a book when I was a kid, I saw a picture of Willis O'Brien. You know, and he's got these armatures, these small scale creatures that look like a job where a fella could bring his toys to work with him. And I was like, I need a job like that. I was working at a studio that did two animated films. They made a film called Rover Dangerfield and a film called Baby's Kids, which actually was a kind of little bit of a hit. I was a effects animator on those. And when they stopped making features at that studio, it occurred to me that Disney would not stop making animated films super soon, so I applied there. They looked at my work, which wasn't great at the time. I thought it was pretty dope. And they offered me a trainee role. I wised up and saw it as a really great opportunity. So I started there as a trainee uh, during The Lion King, and I've been there ever since. Well, the Lion King was the first film that I worked on that people saw, that felt really good. Atlantis has a kind of this comic book style, and that was the first time that I was actually a head of the department that, that felt really good. They've all had been a gift of some sort. In animation, you don't, you're not putting the camera at anything. Everything is being created by a computer or drawn or painted. As a visual effects supervisor, what I do all day is actually look at the works of animators or modelers or lighters or effects artists and make sure it's actually close to what I understand the director really wants and make sure it's actually helping support the visual storytelling. As an effects animator, what we do is kind of goes unseen. You know, no one really kind of responds to like a dust cloud or, or some debris falling. I've been fortunate to make a bunch of films like Frozen and Moana where effects are front and center. When you have a sister who's shooting snow and ice out of her hands, people notice those effects or water as a character. Uh, people tend to notice those. Last year, I was elected to the Board of Governors of the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences. It made me feel really great. The Board of Governors preserves what the Academy has done in the past. It looks to what we can do in the future. I'm part of the shorts and feature animation branch. So I try to represent the people that are short filmmakers and animation folks. But made me feel like people trying to trust in me to kind of have their voice. I like to actually make these 
films that people go see that means a lot to people that folks see as a child and maybe they'll see it again as an adult and they see it they'll show it to their kids and they'll show it to their grandkids there's very few films that people feel that way about it. animated features disney films in particular have that place in people's hearts as an artist and especially as an artist of color um i do like showing up things just like this because no one sees animators i like showing kids like myself that oh damn there's a, there's some black people that worked on that thing you know i like leading with some sort of open heartedness and kindness i mean my attitude if you've been hired at disney you must be pretty good so you don't need me to ride you you need me to help give you an opportunity to uh to shine and that's what I, that's the kind of leader i try to be scan the qr code on your screen to follow us on facebook twitter or instagram we're at the St. Louis Art Museum in Age of Armor, treasures from the Higgins Armory Collection at the Worcester Art Museum, which is here on view at the museum through May 14th. This exhibition features about 140 artworks. Um, about 90 of them come to the museum from the Worcester Art Museum as part of a traveling exhibition. We've supplemented the show with paintings, prints, tapestries, and armor from our own collection this show tries to show that armor has been around forever and continues to be used up to the present day. I think the earliest element in the show is an Egyptian axe from 2000 BC. There's also a Greek helmet from 600 BCE. And we run it right up to the present day with armor that's used by the U.S. Army infantry today. We've also spiced it up with some uh, intriguing elements, bringing the show up to the very contemporary with Black Panther and Stormtrooper, which are reflections of earlier armor, but in a pop culture sort of way. When we were planning this exhibition, we were looking for a dramatic element. Um, as people come around the corner into this gallery and uh, you be the judge of whether that's a dramatic element. When you come to this exhibition, you're gonna see dazzling armors from the Renaissance, You'll see tapestries, paintings, prints that you don't normally get to see. And another point we tried to make in the show is that there's a strong relationship between armor for war, armor for sport, and fashion. So armor was very much contemporary clothing. It was ornamented and worn not just on the battlefield, but in sport and around the court. You'd wear armor with clothing elements to show your status, to show your fashion sense and taste. Normally when you come to the art museum, uh, we ask you not to touch anything, but there are engagement and interactive elements in this exhibition. You'll be able to place your hand into a gauntlet. You'll be able to feel chainmail. We have some reproductions in the gallery, so you get a sense of what these materials feel like and look like. We really hope you come and see this exhibition. It's a rare opportunity to see one of the great collections of armor in America. Age of Armor runs at the St. Louis Art Museum until May 14th, 2023, and there's more information on our website, www.slam.org. Yo, this Dip, the founder of 314 Day. Now you can show your love for 314 even more. We're celebrating 314 Day from March 10th through the 14th by shopping and eating at your favorite St. Louis places. So head over to stl.com slash 314 Day for all the happenings. Different musical instruments make different sounds for many reasons. It could be the material, whether it's made from wood, plastic, the cardboard, any, any material is going to resonate sound differently. But also the type of strings, the length of the string, there's so many different elements that go into a musical instrument. And the cool thing about instrument design in general is that you change one of those elements and you get a totally different sound. The shape of the instrument really does affect the sound in so many ways that you might not think of. First of all, the size is really important. The larger the size of the instrument, generally the lower the pitch will be, the smaller, the higher the pitch. And a more angular instrument is going to have a, a sharper sound and a rounder instrument is going to be more gentle, more balanced, and just project in different ways. 
All of sound is vibration. It really boils down to that. And that vibration is produced through so many different ways. For a stringed instrument, that vibration is coming from plucking the string or the friction of a bow crossing the string. For a percussive instrument, that might come from shaking the instrument or tapping it or even scraping it. And then the same goes for wind instruments. Blowing air is a very different sound than if you were to pluck a string or shake a percussive instrument. All of those ways create vibrations in different and unique ways that produce different sounds. Celebrate Arts in Our Schools Month and learn more about music, dance, theater, and visual arts with over 800 videos for students at educate.today. Looking for videos to use in homeschool, classroom, or hybrid learning settings? Need them aligned to standards, lesson plans, or activity ideas? We've got them at educate.today. For decades, experts have warned that a large swath of the central U.S. is at risk for a devastating earthquake produced from the New Madrid fault line. The St. Louis region has two seismic zones, including the New Madrid, which caused a series of major earthquakes about 200 years ago. Three magnitude 7.5 to 7.7 earthquakes rang church bells as far away as South Carolina and briefly caused the Mississippi River to flow backward. And experts say there's up to a 10% chance a major earthquake could happen again within the next 50 years. Scientists say, you know, every day that we're closer to an earthquake, but they can't plan for when that date is. As the emergency management coordinator for the Missouri Department of Transportation, Michael White is all about being prepared. And this is for the hundreds of emergency managers, transportation leaders, and others dedicated to earthquake preparedness. Helping the response community better prepare for a new matter earthquake event. According to FEMA, a magnitude 7.7 earthquake in the New Madrid zone could displace nearly 850,000 people in up to eight states, including people in the St. Louis area. And, you know, you look at electricity, power, you know, we have injuries and the hospitals are impacted. We may have 250 to 350,000 evacuees. So MoDOT launched a first of its kind, a study focused on forming evacuation routes in the St. Louis area in the event of a major earthquake. This is accomplished by partnering with the University of Missouri, as St. Louis is considered a challenging location. The number of river crossings and how much traffic those roadways carry, I-70, the 270s, and all of those um, uh, corridors. So that's a big challenge. The other is um, the proximity to the Wabash uh, seismic zone in addition to the New Madrid. And some of the buildings are historic and they may not have been designed to the current standards. Praveen Idra, MU professor and chair of civil and environmental engineering, is the lead investigator of the study. Funding from MoDOT will provide software for the Mizzou engineers to see how roads, bridges, and other infrastructure might be impacted by a major earthquake. They will use shake cast data from the U.S. Geological Survey to build simulation models to evaluate various roads and bridges in the event of a large earthquake. We request data for varying um, severity levels, starting from a 5.0 magnitude to all the way to seven. We do look at how do we load the demand? Is everyone leaving right away or is 20% leaving in the first few hours, then the remaining 20% and so on? They also expect emergency aid would be cut off. Identify alternative routes and you know how's, how best to move people in and out. The project involves several steps over a two-year period. The research team completed the first step, a survey of St. Louis area residents, asking them which routes they would take to evacuate. Primarily saying that they'll stick with the interstates. So the I-70s, 270, 55, and uh, the major the major interstate system. The research team will assess bridge structures along those routes using national bridge inventory data that will be added to the data from different pieces of the project. Combine 
into a network model or a traffic simulation model that routes evacuees. Looking at the engineering and, and upgrades um, for the bridges, I think one key planning piece for us is accessibility across state lines, probably planning that those bridges are impacted. So we're really planning to bring everybody to the West, Kansas City and Springfield will be key reception centers for evacuees. There's been a lot of progress made in transportation engineering. These models wouldn't have been possible uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. So all the computational advances is what makes it easier today to even think of assigning such high traffic volumes and come up with reasonable estimates of how the road network will look like under different earthquake scenarios. The art of airplane propellers, later on Spotlight. Crime writer Elizabeth George brings to life two beloved characters in her best-selling and long-running series of Thomas Lindley novels. Something to Hide is George's 21st book featuring Detective Inspector Thomas Lindley and Detective Sergeant Barbara Havers. This time, the pair untangle a crime with hidden links to London's immigrant community. George's meticulous research places readers firmly in London neighborhoods, some familiar and some not. I've always loved books that expose me to a place, and so that was what I wanted the reader to see in my books. Suspense, intrigue, Scotland Yard detectives, and a twisting and surprising plot combine to make George's Something to Hide a page turner. I would have thought that you lived in London. London is so well described in your book. How do you know so much about London? I'm very much intent upon the books, giving the reader the experience of the place where I set them. I've always loved books that expose me to a place. When it comes to London, there's so much more there than what the typical tourist sees. And uh, so what I've spent all these years doing is exploring various areas of London by, first of all, reading as much about London as I can. I have countless books on London, books that have explained particular areas, uh, particular sites within those areas. And then I go out and look at all these different locations. How do you know so much about how detectives work? In the very beginning, um, I, I knew only what I could find out from policemen on the street because I wasn't a published writer. I was writing about police work. I was writing about police work in England. And so uh, in those days, it was not difficult to find a, a Bobby on the street who was willing to talk to me. Then as I went along, I um, began to make contacts within various police organizations. You have so much suspense in your books. How do you keep that suspense going? Suspense is the reader wanting to know more. And the way that I, be, uh, that I build suspense, where I build in the reader the desire to do more, is by always laying down a dramatic question when I am writing a scene. And that means that something in this scene causes another scene to occur somewhere down the line. And it's usually the dramatic question that is going to cause another scene to happen. And so frequently I'm told by people that they were just propelled through a novel that was over 600 pages long and they have no idea why they, how they were able to read it so fast. I'm really committed to the idea of causality and asking and answering dramatic questions. To find out why this book took her two years to write, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. We're here at the St. Louis Science Center to talk about Becoming Jane, the evolution of Dr. Jane Goodall. This exhibition is about one of our most legendary living scientists, Dr. Jane Goodall, and it's through her perspective. Rarely do we get to have a scientist of her caliber tell her own story, but in this exhibition, she's talking directly to you about her life's work, and in fact, there's a hologram of Jane in here that'll talk directly to your family as you visit. 
But this exhibition is about her whole life and how she got to where she is today. To tell Jane's story of her childhood, there are a lot of her personal objects on display. We move through her adulthood where we learn how she got to where she is. She didn't start out as a scientist, as it turns out. A chance meeting in Africa led her to meet one of the greatest anthropologists of the 20th century, Dr. Lewis Leakey, who assigned her to start researching chimpanzees with no scientific background whatsoever. But it was because of this lack of background and an extreme amount of patience on her part, she was able to make some discoveries about the behaviors of chimps that we had never seen before. She would take very detailed notes in a handwritten journal. And in fact, in this exhibition, there's an area where the uh, journal can really come to life and show you those chimpanzee behaviors in an animated form. This exhibition will be on display here at the St. Louis Science Center until April, and you can find more information at slsc.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. I really, really enjoy the working with my hands. I love to craft, I love it. I've always crafted, even when I was little. So this is like crafting, but it's a practical crafting. Because after you get done, it gets to fly. The Wright brothers made their prop out of wood, and I don't guess I'm doing much different. Um, <laughs> I probably have a better glue. I probably um, have a little bit more data. But other than that, the process is not, you know, incredibly different. My props go all over the world. I have props in Chile. I have props in New Zealand, in Canada, in Japan. I have a lot in Australia. I never make the same prop twice. So there's probably not very many um, wooden propeller makers out there that do this many oddball props like I do. <laughs> it is a, about a six day process, start to finish. There's a lot of things where I could just plug in all the calculations and plug in all the measurements and it would just spit out what it thinks that I should build. But there's a lot more than that. A lot of it is experience. You have to know about every airframe and its speeds and its performance and what it's actually made for. And you take all that information and you put it together. People are literally basing their lives that I did my job. And I don't take it lightly. We got into this business when my grandpa was a crop duster. If you wanted to spend time with dad or grandpa, you better grab a wrench. So they were always working on the next plane, the next design, the next, the next thing. That's what they did together. At about eight, I was already covering planes. I worked at this shop in high school, and then I went to college. I was going to college to get my associates in business, and then I was gonna be a cosmetologist. And in between classes, I would come to the shop and help. I would do all the little things, and then it just got more and more. I cut my first prop whenever nobody was here, so they wouldn't let me use the lathe on my own. But nobody was here, and it was already set up. So <laughs> I'm like, you know what, I think I can do it. And when Grandpa comes in tomorrow, it'll be done, and then he'll know that I can do it, and then, then, then I'll, the, that's my end. So I did. And I did it wrong, <laughs> but the sanding guy fixed it. It wasn't like a big, big wrong. It was just like, you know, stuff just a tiny bit. So he sanded it out and it was fine. And then I got to run the lathe from then on. Grandpa and I were, we were besties. <laughs> and he was my teacher. I mean, he's who I learned everything from. Everything that I use here on a daily basis, I learned from my dad or my grandpa.
in December of 2016, Grandpa had a farming accident. He was here one day and gone the next. So that was a huge hit. He was healthy, everything here is wonderful, coming in every day to nothing. He's not here anymore. My dad and my husband both got new jobs, and so that pretty much left me and Grandma. Me and Grandma here all day long to run the prop shop on our own. I was thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? How in the world am I gonna do this? But then I just decided I was just gonna do it, and that's all there was to it. And I'm glad I did. And it went well, actually. It went really well because the thing about being by yourself is nobody can tell you no. Nobody tell, can tell you what you can or can't do. You get to do whatever you want to when you're alone. Grandpa would definitely be proud of me. And there are times where it's like you can just feel it. Most of the time, it's when I'm sanding. I have made probably a thousand propellers start to finish and he would still come up, every single one, and critique it. He'd come up behind me. Elena, that, that tip needs to come down, it's a little too thick. Elena, you got it a little too thick up here. Don't get that too thin, Elena, that's awful thin. You can have to come back. So every time I'm standing, I can hear his voice in my head. What I miss the most about Grandpa is being able to call him and ask him. Just in your head, you just go, I just, I should call grandpa. I don't have that anymore. So that's really um, hard because I don't, sometimes I don't know what to do. Or I say, well, my engineer looked at it. <laughs> I don't have an engineer to look at it anymore. <laughs> Thank you. I do get a ton of support from my family. My dad always helps me with consultations when I don't know what to do. And then Grandma comes in every day at about 10.30, and she cleans, and she knocks all the sharp edges off of the glue, and mostly she cleans. She cleans up my messes. Did you have a good day? Yeah. I have two girls. They're seven and nine, and they grew up in the shop. They've made their own little 26-inch tiny human props that are their size. I need to balance it and put a finish varnish coat on it and I was going to do green tips. What I hope my kids are picking up here is that it feels good to work hard because it really does. I hope my girls do realize that they can do whatever they want to do by seeing me do something that's not typical. Someone asked me, how much would you sell your prop shop for? I said, I wouldn't, it's not for sale. I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's my everything. It's my happy place. Next week, meet the family from Nobelese Winery. Plus, a new way to enjoy Forest Park. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.